have the time and also opportunity to explore each and every city. So thank you for the wonderful video, Shivram. Uh, I think we can get get it started. Uh, good evening and a very warm welcome uh, to everyone. We appreciate you being here with us today. And it's nice to see you all here again. So as I've been telling uh, in the previous webinar that uh, the IRIS webinar series is gaining a momentum in the public domain. And it's my pleasure to happily share that we have already crossed thousands and thousands of registrations and participants. So the main idea behind these webinars is to showcase the innovative research being generated at uh, IIT Madras uh, to various stakeholders like researchers, industrialists, and policymakers. And yes, we are here again, and it's our pleasure to uh, present the eighth webinar, uh, which is Computer Vision in the IRIS webinar series uh, under the cluster Sensing and Vision. So the research initiative under the Computer Vision Technology Project is led by Professor A. N. Rajkopalan. To say a few words about Dr. Rajagopalan, <clears throat> so he's a Starlight Technology Chair professor in the uh, professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering at IIT Madras, and also head the Image Processing and Computer Vision Lab. So he's a fellow of the Indian National Academy of Engineering, fellow of the Alexander Ohm Humboldt Foundation Germany, and also the fellow of uh, Institution of uh, Electronics and Telecommunication Engineers. So he has served as the associate editor of IEEE Transaction Sound Pattern Analysis and Machine Intelligence from 2007 to 2011. And also uh, as the associate editor of IEEE Transaction on Image Processing from 2012 to 2016. And also as a senior area editor for IEEE Transaction on Image Processing since 2016. So he is the recipient of DAE SRC Outstanding Investigator Award in 2012. So uh, the Vaswick Industrial Research Award in 2013 and the, the Mid Career Institute Research and Development Award from IIT Madras in 2014 and the Google India AI ML Faculty Research Award in 2018. It goes long and long. His uh, research uh, activities are funded by MHRD, DST, DAE, DRDO, AFRL, and KLA Tenka from USA, Google India, Adobe from USA, among others. So he had uh, held visiting positions at the University of Maryland, Technical University of Munich. So Professor Raj Gopalan's current research interests include uh, recovering shape from X, image restoration, image forensics, underwater imaging, deep learning, multimodal learning, and sport analytics. Mm -hmm. uh, so joining Professor Raj Gopalan as a speaker today's of webinar. Thank you, sir. So we also have Dr. Rama Chellapa has joined as the moderator. Well, uh, he is a Bloomberg a Distinguished Professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and Biomedical Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. So before joining JHU in August 2020, he was a Distinguished University Professor at Minta Martin, a Professor of Engineering, a Professor in the EC Department and the University of uh, Maryland Institute Advanced Computer Studies at uh, UND. So he's a recipient of 2020 IEEE Jack. S. Kilby Signal Processing Medal. Uh, he is also a recipient of the KS Fu Prize from the International Association of Patent Recognition. Uh, he also received the Technical Achievement and Meritorious Service Awards from the IEEE Computer Society. Recently, he was recognized uh, with the Inaugural Leadership Award from the IEEE Biometric Council. He's a fellow of IEEE 
IAPR, OSA, AAAS, ACM, and AAAI. So he served as the editor in chief of IEEE Transaction on Pattern Analysis and Machine Intelligence. He has served as a general and technical program chair for uh, several IEEE international and uh, national conferences and workshops. He is a Golden Co member of the IEEE Computer Society and served as the distinguished lecturer of IEEE Signal Processing Society. He served as the I inaugural president of the IEEE Biometric Councils too. So Professor Chalapa's current research uh, interests are computer vision, machine learning, artificial intelligence and signal and image video processing. So it's my pleasure to invite you both to this uh, session, Professor. Over to you, Dr. Chalapa. Thank you. Professor Chalapa? Yeah, hi. Yeah, yeah. You, can, uh, you can lead the session, the, the floor is yours. Okay, oh, thank you. Um, all right, um, Raja, we are all waiting to hear from you. I guess you're gonna uh, give a presentation and uh, uh, those in attendance can put your questions in, in the chat. And uh, so it's about 30 minute presentation, is it? Right, right. It's about, okay. it's about uh, yeah. 30 okay. minutes. Yeah, 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 go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chalapa. Uh, this is Raj Gopalan. I am a faculty in the Department of Electrical Engineering at IIT Madras, and uh, I head the IPCV lab at IIT Madras. And uh, I am here to share a research initiative on this prospective center of excellence in computer vision. Uh, and uh, I will, I will, I'll try to move on to the next slide. I mean, are you able to see my slide, by the way? Um, no, we we don't. I don't see your slides. Okay. okay then maybe maybe. Okay. Let me just start sharing it because for some reason. Um, one minute. Okay. Let me see. Uh, just a second. Let me let me get the screen sharing going. Uh, well, this I'm clicking on the Zoom link, but for some reason, some reason. Uh, would you need any help, Professor? Uh, yeah, I mean, my yeah, Zoom probably, is, yeah, is, I, is. Have you locked my screen or something? Because uh, I'm not. No. Uh, no. Yeah, I'll just try to uh, unspotlight you. Uh, yeah. Naresh, can you please do that? Because my Zoom, when I click on it, it doesn't seem to do anything at all. Uh, Mr. Naresh? Yeah, I've uh, removed the spotlight. Okay, sir, uh, I think uh, just minimize or else uh, uh, you can just uh, minimize the screen and open it again. Okay. And then try to uh, share the click on share screen. No, when I click on the Zoom link, right, it doesn't come on. Right? I mean, for some reason, when so I click on the Zoom are, link, are you I, trying to present the screen from the uh, from a PowerPoint? No, 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 no. This is supposed to be a Google slide. Okay. Uh, Google slide. So Raju, you could also email the slides to me. Uh, no, actually, right. It should work out. I'm just uh, oh, okay. Okay. I think I think I'm I'm fine. One minute, just a second. Okay. I think I am there almost. Let me see. Uh, how do I how do I get to the full view? Then I think uh, now everything will work out fine. I'm not able. Okay, I think I'm I'm kind of right, good to go. So please tell me if you're able to see my screen. Yep, I think we. Yes. 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 All right. All right. So um, then, very good. So I think now I should be done very quickly. Let me just open my this one presentation now. Sorry for that small delay. I had it on, but uh, I had to close it because uh, we had to get the Zoom going. I had to go to my drive. Right. 
right? I think we are all set now. Okay, now are you able to see it full screen? Yes, Professor. Yeah. All right. Thank you for bearing with me. Is, is it coming full screen yet? Uh, uh, yes. Just a second, I think it should load. All right, now I can see it. Are you able to see it too? Yes, yes, yeah. okay. go ahead. Okay, so, so right, let me start with my slide on uh, acknowledgement, right, which is which is, a, which is an acknowledgement to all my students who's been, uh, who have been my civil research scholars, both the PhD and MS, right? These are all students, some from, uh, many from the past, from, from ongoing, right? Some are ongoing students. Uh, so basically these are the backbone, right? Of the lab, you know, as, as is the case, I guess, with every lab right, around the world. And uh, let me also mention that we have a very, right? Along the way, right, we would like to have a strong impetus for outreach and which also means that you know we are very keen about hiring young foreign faculty, and of course you know I've shared this link out there, which you can actually click on later for those of you who want to understand how this entire thing works, because I don't have the time to go to the exact details of each of these mechanisms, but just you know click on the link and you will know, you know what information you want out there. We're interested in exchange of you know international uh, international grad students facilitating you know uh, this one foreign faculty visits maybe for a month or so, or even more if needed, then join papers and talk venues, attract you know, high quality students for PhD, and, uh, and also right, try to attract exceptional Indian uh, PDFs. And also, of course, I'm in the process, you know, encourage industry participation. And, uh, and uh, you know, along the way, we also want to, uh, yeah, right? And uh, okay, so why, uh, so are we, are we really up there? So in a sense, right, I just wanted to give you give you a sneak peek into our recent research activities, right, of the IPCV lab. And I'm glad to share with you that in the last five years, we have had about 17 regular papers in A star conferences, such as CVPR. Those of you who work in vision, right, you know, would all be very familiar with these conferences, CVPR, ECCV, AAAI, AC, you know, ICCV, and so on. And then an almost an you know, equal number of journal papers in TIP. Time EIJC and so on, right? So, so we are one of the most active research groups in the area of computer vision in India, and uh, and I thought, right? And I thought I'll spend, you know, uh, spend a small amount of time trying to highlight some of the theme and try to talk about, kind of give you a glimpse. That's why I call it a sneak peek into some of the recent research activities that we've been doing in our lab. So I kind of set the tone, and then of course, then we will move on to things that we want to look uh, look ahead, right? In terms of what we want to do as part of the Center of Excellence. Uh, so let me kind of move on to the next one. Uh, so, so, so the first thing, right, that I wanted to just introduce was, was about there was about the motion deblurring problem. This is a CVPR regular paper, a 2020 paper, and here, right, we I mean motion blur until about a few years ago, right, it was very important. I mean, in order to see sharp images, people don't like to see right I mean, images that are blurred. But then off late, and it has gained even more importance because. Because most of the I don't, deep net deep networks are be are, are can I say right, typically trained with sharp images and therefore right when they when they are shown blurred images they can they can kind of uh, they can get stumped right so that so the idea is to be able to able to create sharp uh, sharp say right images I know if you if you kind of give a blurred image as a picture and uh, right, these are typically right, this is typically a hard problem because what could happen is you can have a scene where where you know you can have the camera that's moving you can also have some objects that are moving inside the scene. And on top of that, you can also have you know some sort of you know a 3D sort of a depth variation, right? which really means that you need an algorithm or you need a technique that is going to handle all of these together. So in this work, what we did was actually that, and what we did was you know brought in and uh, sort of an attention mechanism, and right? we should also look at the global context as well as the local context through something called a cross-aware attention and something called uh, has a content-aware attention. This kind of a patch hierarchical kind of a framework. And um, and of course, you know, I have the kind of details here for those of you who are interested. We can kind of you know look at the details later when you have a Q and A session, if there is time. Uh, anyway, right? I mean, uh, so these uh, so the slides are going to be up there for for all of you to kind of see. And uh, and then uh, let me just share you one of the outputs that we have here. So as you can see on the left, this this is a blurred picture, and you can see that this guy in the front is is, is quite blurred as opposed to others. And therefore, right, what happens is we have a deep network that kind of tends to pay. Pay kind of more attention to to regions that are more blurred, which is what which is what it ideally ideally should be doing, 
right? So, which is what it exactly does here. So, if you notice, right, it is able to pay more attention on the person right, who's blurred, and of course, it also pays attention to others that are that are relatively also blurred. And then we also introduce a dynamic filtering kernel because because we realize that it's not a great idea to have a kernel that is no no that has a fixed offset. So, we introduced right you know, into this deep learning uh, sort of uh, you know, uh, into this deep network also uh, you know, a facility to kind of uh, to, to automatically adapt the offset of the kernel, and which is what you see here. So the kernel offsets are typically large for the regions that are more blurred and then small for the other regions, right? And uh, just, you know, a quick look at some of these pictures. They show one, for example, if you notice this lady out here, you can see a picture coming out very clearly. In our, uh, this one, it's kind of a state-of-the-art art of this method at that time. Now, uh, the uh, next one, right, which I want to talk about uh, is, uh, you know, is unconstrained motion deep learning. This is a traditional approach. This is a CBPR 18 paper. So here, right, I mean, we all know that we have cameras now these days that come with multiple lenses, not just two, you can have three, four, and so on. And therefore, one kind of wonders, right, what does one do, right? Uh, I mean, so one of the things is that if you had a blurred picture again, so the second talk is also about something, you know, which is related to motion deep learning. And the idea is that you could take just one image and try uh, some kind of a deep learning, but then, uh, but then, uh, right? Given the fact that you have a depth-dependent blur, you could actually, you know, you know, utilize the second image also. Right? You could have a blurred because in this case you have a blurred pair. Now, until our work, there were these other works that were trying attempting something similar, but they used a constrained sort of a setting, which meant that these two cameras would have to be identical. So we kind of relaxed that. We said that one of the cameras, so you could have wide field of view, narrow field of view, you could have different exposure times, you could have a resolution, right, which may not be the same in both the lenses. And yet, right, you would want to do a depth estimation come and come sort of a sort of a deep learning. Right. And we actually showed that this is a fairly ill-posed problem. It turns out that if you try to estimate the motion density function for, for you know for let's say each of the cameras or each of the images, then what can happen is you could have a drift, right? They could so both MDS could have a mutual drift, which can actually give you the observed images that you're actually seeing, but then you know it can lead to a left-right inconsistency in terms of the stereo cue. Right. So we actually solved this problem and we showed that uh, you know in the process, I mean, you could not only estimate depth, but then you could also create sharp pictures. And instead of going through everything, I would just ask you to ask you to look at these small zoomed in sort of sub images, right, where you get an idea about you know, what kind of what kind of uh, what kind of sharpness we get, as opposed to other methods which struggle typically, right, when you have cameras that are unconstrained. Moving on, uh, the I mean, next one, right, which I want to talk about is actually bringing blurred, uh, bringing like blurred moments. Now, this is a CVPR 2019 paper. This is the first time, in fact, ever. And until this work, right, people were always talking about creating a sharp picture given a blurred picture. And then we, for the first time, right, talked about how actually, you know, if one looks at how a blurred image is formed, what really happens is, you know, you have a camera in action that is kind of, you know, that is kind of witnessing the scene. And during the exposure time, a lot could happen. Your camera could be moving. You could have dynamic objects, right, which are actually moving in the scene. You could have depth differences, right, people standing in the front, people standing somewhere else behind and all of that. And all these warped versions, right, in a sense, I mean, you have a weighted warp of all these, or a weighted warp of a latent sort of a sharp image, right, which you would like to ideally see. And what happens is you have this average of all of this going on, and when you know when the shutter snaps, right at the time, all that you get is one sort of a blurred picture. So if you just look at a blurred picture, it looks very dull. Of course, you can sharpen it, but then we went one step ahead and we asked, right, can get a real, real of what exactly happened right during the time that the shutter was on. So, so I'm going to show this, show this video, right, where you can see that the first image is. The first uh, row is all still, you know, images. These are all blurred. But then, out of the blurred image, we could actually create a video. Right? For example, the last row is our output, where you can see that, you know, you get a sense for what really happened during the time that the exposure was open. Right. So basically, this was the very first work, right, of its kind to actually tell that, you know, you could actually produce a video from from a single sort of a blurred image. And uh, I would also like you to, you know, uh, no, to kind of right, take a look at this lady's leg, for example. This is a very, very local motion, right? You can see that she's shaking her leg. And, and uh, no, even something like that, right, you can actually locally capture. So it not only captures global camera motion, it also accounts for any local sort of a sort of a motion, right, which can happen. And it kind of relives, right, what you might like to see in a kind of a blurred image. Right? So kind of very, very first work of its kind. Uh, and of course, you know, there's of course, you know, one more, one more case. Okay, let me go. And now the next one, right, that I wanted to talk about was, uh, was kind of unrolling the shutter. So we all know that, you know, most of the CMOS cameras these days come with a rolling shutter, which means that not all rows of the sensors are exposed to the same camera motion, right? So what the first row sees is probably not the same as what the, what the last row sees in terms of the camera motion. 
right? And, and this really matters when the, when the camera motion is fast enough or if there is an object, right, which is moving, that is moving fast enough, right? Uh, you know, as, opposed to the, as opposed to the shutter time and so on. So, so here, right, what we actually did was, so one of the things that you really need is in order to be able to, able to get a rectify. And we know that if there is camera motion, then our general notion is that lines will remain lines. And if there is, a, if there is an exposure that is too long, you can at most get a blurred line, but then a line, right, will stay as a line. But then what happens is in case of the rolling shutter, when there's camera motion, a line can bend, right? Like for example, in this case, this building that you see here, you can see a bend, right, happening, which is actually not true. The original scene doesn't have that bend. But then because of the camera motion, you can end up seeing a bent, sort of a bend, you can see bent lines and so on. And therefore, this work actually takes that into account. And it is a kind of a parametric formulation within a deep network. And what we typically solve for is really an X translational motion and then a rotation along, along the Z axis. And we solve for this, and then of course, and what you really need to do is estimate camera motion for every row. You assume a smooth motion, interpolate it, and then you can actually unwarp in order to be able to see a rectified image, right? So I'm going to show this blown up picture. So you can see that after rectification, these lines become, the building looks uh, looks vertical. Otherwise it looks like, you know, one of the wall is curved, the, the wall edge is curved. Similarly, this is inside a tray, right? You can see that, you know, the, 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 the bent is removed. And, uh, and of course, uh, here are some still images. The, uh, the nice thing about this work was it could do it with just one image. Well, during that time, the state of the art was that you, know, you needed multiple images in order to be able to do it, whereas we could show that this could be done with just a single image. Here is a still image, for example, for a certain class like the face class. If there's a rolling shutter effect, you can see that you know there's a skew in the face, whereas, whereas after we run our, 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 our some method, you now you get the faces as you should normally be able to see them. Right, going moving forward, let, uh, we also did. Uh, you know, we've also done some works on robust super resolution, and especially for the unpaired case, because that is what is most challenging. And and you know these days people are looking at problems of the kind where let's say you have uh, degradations that are really very severe. You know, not the kind of things that we were seeing like five years ago. And for, and for example, right, you know, we did some work, you know, where we showed that even if you had a picture which is as bad as this, and there is no paired version for this, you don't know how the how the high quality image of this guy looks like. I mean, this is called the Wilder Face data set. And, uh, and, I, and, then, and then you know you can't train with with a pair where you where you know the person, right? So this is kind of hallucinating, but but then hallucinating you know in a sense that you know which kind of which you know sort of emulates what what we as humans do. So what we as humans do is that if you have two pictures, low resolution of the same person, but then if they are kind of degraded, we still want to sort of say that you know it's the same person. So this kind of a deep network does exactly that, and you can see here the output. So you have a low resolution picture of this guy. And then of course, it's very hard to really prove whether this is correct or not, but then uh, you know, it can only be a sort of right, a qualitative sort of a judgment right here where you kind of see, and then you look at the picture and you sort of believe that yes, right, I mean, it's doing okay. Right? And then the next one that I want to talk about is a degradation of that image restoration. This is a recent paper in a, in a, in a special issue of JSTSP in February 2021. And here it is about you know, a deraining problem. And it's not just for deraining, this can be even applied for raindrops or if you have whatever, I don't know, anything that is spatially varying. And right? if you had a degradation that was spatially varying, varying right? I mean, uh, so in this paper, what we actually proposed was you know, estimating or learning. Uh, learning a degradation mask that is spatially varying, and then use this mask to sort of guide the reconstruction process. And uh, right, and this mask also tells the kind of reconstruction network where to focus on. For example, when we say this, uh, uh, when we say that this degradation is spatially varying, what we really mean is, you know, there are there are parts of the scene which are totally unaffected or very little, uh, no, or, or, or or which are seldom affected or very little affected, and there are regions which are which are affected a lot. For example, when I'm going to play this video where on the left you see a rainy sort of a sort of a scene, and on the right when you see that the rain rain streaks have been kind of removed, and which is what we mean by a spatially varying sort of a, sort of a degradation. Moving on. Uh, the next one that we did was again, right, these are all unpaired, you know, in all these cases, you don't have a sort of you know, a clean image. For example, you don't have a database. Well, let's say, you know, somebody took a scene on a day when it was very, very nice, no rains and nothing. And then from the same viewpoint, you know, the same person took another picture, right, you know, when there was rain. It's impossible to have situations like that. More so if you're looking at underwater, right, and underwater, it's, it's especially impossible to get a, get a kind of a pair, right, where you have a clean image and then you have you have you know, a pair for that, which is actually a degraded version. All that you have are hazy images. Now, the one right, that I'm showing you is actually a Dwarka. Uh, no, this is from uh, this one. 
uh, this place Varka, which is actually a city uh, right in India. Uh, part of it is actually submerged in the water. This is the banks of the Gomti River. And uh, right, this is a video that was shared with us by the Enoi O people, and they wanted to see right, if, we could, if we could actually restore it. So this is a TIP paper of 2019, where we use the idea of local proximity, right, which basically means that the attenuation uh, and, and you see air light are the two important factors where, which, uh, which, could, uh, which could contribute to haze. So we kind of you know, assume them to be locally constant, and then we use non-local means in order to be able to estimate the you know, ir irradiance. Right. By doing that, we actually show this via. So after doing that, you can see clearly that, of course, you know, in this, we don't have a ground truth at all, right? There's no map, there's no, there's no clean, unclean pair or anything. All that you have is a kind of a hazy picture of, of an underwater scene of an underwater scene. The one that you see on the right is a, is a reason method that is deep learning based. And the one in the middle is our method. So our seems to be doing reasonably well as compared to a deep learning method that has probably been learned over now so several, several, uh, no, whatever, right? Hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of images. Uh, let me now move on to, to kind of right, going forward. What activities have we planned for the center? Right now, we have kind of identified three main areas right, which we think are very exciting as we go forward. And, and you will see that these are not just uh, no, just, uh, just an incremental version of what we are already doing. Right? What we are doing, we showed some of those, I showed you some of those things. And going forward, right, I mean, there's a major kind of shift in what we want to do. So we want to do something like multimodal learning. Now that right, we know that the web is flooded with all kinds of data, visual, audio, text, language, all of that, right? So we want to kind of learn the semantic relation. It's kind of loose, you know, there is no kind of tight relationship, but there is a loose relationship that exists between these uh, between these modalities. And we want to exploit them, right? We want to harness them in order to be able to, able to solve some uh, joint tasks, right? And uh, the second one that we are looking at is uh, you know, computer vision for AR, VR, and smart, smartphones. Uh, especially for smartphones, you know, which are kind of handheld and so on, not for the, not for the general, not the you know, general AR, VR, right? That let's say everybody probably, you know, that a lot of people are doing. And then we are also interested in some kind of large-scale surveillance, but large-scale surveillance, you know, just from the point of view of road traffic or road traffic management and so on. I mean, not, not in its entire sort of generality. Uh, then, okay, now going forward, Okay, now uh, right, just to just to kind of motivate, right? What we what I mean by multi multimodal, right? I'm going to play this audio first. And and you know and kind of if you, if you hear this is audio, I hope you are able to hear. Uh, uh, Professor Chalaba, are you able to hear the audio? Yeah, yeah, I do, I do. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so now when you hear the audio, you know that they're not observed of a bird, but then beyond that, right, you don't have any any idea about, about probably what's happening. Now I'm going to play this video right here. All that you see is a bird, right, that's walking around, and then uh, and then all, all that you have is that information, and maybe right, it's doing something. Now, if I combine both, right, if I give you give you a picture like this, where, where the same audio, right, which I played you before, and now, now you have a lot more information, right? You know that, okay, there's a bird, and there's a bird, right, which is also making this noise. And going one step further, right, I can go, I'm going to play this, the next video, where you'll hear something. He also, in his attempt to outsing his rivals, incorporates other sounds that he hears in the forest. That was a camera shutter. Right? Okay, so you so you kind of heard that, right? So what this means is that I mean, right? With the you know, with uh, let's say video alone, with video plus audio plus, plus video plus audio plus some language or plus some text, right? All of this boosts our ability to know what is happening around us, right? And uh, which is exactly okay what we want to do. Now, when I go forward, uh, one of the first things that you know, which, I, which I want to talk about is vision and the kind of language, how these two can be married together. And there are already works, and from now on, whatever, whatever right, I'm going to be talking about are all works that have been that have been done by other groups. Right? Our, some of our works are, are under review. The ones that I'm sharing here are the ones that are already out there. And if you want to know who has done it and so on, there are these links below, right, which you can click if you want to, if you want to read any of those papers. Now, just to start with, right? This is a caption. So, when you have vision and language, I mean, I mean, you can have you can have so many of these uh, of these uh, of these uh, research problems, right? I mean, which actually revolve around them. One of the first, right? I know, which I thought I'll share with you is about the captioning problem. So, in the captioning problem, what you have is you know you show an image to a to a kind of deep network, and then and then you want it to summarize what's happening right in the image. For example, in this case, you show this image, and then you expect a caption like that to come out. Right, which says here that uh, no, whatever a group of people shopping at an uh, at an outdoor market, right? Which is what you want this kind of a, you know a deep network to do, and 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 the way and the way right this is kind of uh, typically done is you have uh, you have a decoder you know which is an RNN typically an you know, and an LSTM 
and then you have an image from where the from where the visual features uh, right you get. This could be typically a BGG network or an R or like a ResNet or something. And then and then these go go as encoded features, and then decode these go as input to a decoder, which is your LSTM, and then right up and out comes the sentence. You can actually go further and then do maybe if you had a video captioning, you can do a frame by frame captioning, but then frame by frame captioning will lose out on the on the kind of temporal connectivity. Whereas if you do a do a dense video caption, that's when you can get different captions and then you can actually associate one caption to another. Right. So, so basically there are already works in this, including some from our own, some from my own lab. Uh, let me just go back and then uh, the writer uh, talk about uh, talk about another problem, which is even more rich in the sense that you know you can start asking things about which is which is called BQA, the question answering. So here, what you could do is you could show an image and then somebody could ask, right? Or, so in this case, what is she eating? And uh, again, right, the output. I mean, you want to say that no, no, right, she's eating uh, eating a so hamburger. And uh, the idea here is that right. I mean, you have um, sort of a uh, so so you have you know a text embedding. And then you have an image feature, and then these two have to be kind of fused in a particular manner. Of course, you know, there are kind of various ways to do it. You could simply concatenate the feature, or 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 you know, or I mean, you could play some attention attention mechanism, whatever it is, right? I mean, it is entirely up to you. And then and then eventually you pose it as a classification problem, right? Wherein at the output, right, you say whether it is hamburger, whether it is something else, and so on. Right? You could also go one step further, and then you know, could also talk about a multimodal verification problem, as 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 this says, right? For example, in this left picture that you see here, I mean. Right, you see a kid next to, uh, right? I mean, next to a dog, and apparently you can ask the sentence: "Is this uh, is this child actually petting a dog?" And then you can answer answer with a false or true. And in this case, of course, it's false. And you can go one step further, right? You can also ask uh, ask. You can also look at problems that can use a caption in order to be able to retrieve an image, right? For example, you know, if I wanted an image like this to come up, I could ask, and you know, I could kind of throw in a sentence like this, which says, "A child in orange clothes." Plays with sheep. Now, just just try to you know, just try to bring out all those images, right, which look like that. Now, again, a framework like this requires you to marry the features right, that come from text, right, where, you know, which is a, and then to to what you see, right. So, so in this case, it's the image feature. So, so normally, what is done is a nonlinear mapping, right, is learned. You know, then try to then try to marry these two features, and therefore, right, during a test time. Right, when you kind of you know when you input a sentence, then, then, then that same kind of a nonlinear mapping, which has been learned through several examples, is then brought on, and then uh, then it is applied on your sentence, and then it finds out with respect to which visual feature you know is this is this is this kind of closest, and then whatever is the, is the image with respect to that you know is is basically shown to you. Right, let me kind of go back, and and I also wanted to talk about another one. You can go one step further. There are works that talk about you know a text to picture. So here, right? Somebody just writes up a text, and it's not about searching for an image. It's about it's about you know having a deep network generate a picture of a certain kind. Now, you know, most recent work, right, which came in 27, not very recent, but a 2017 work talks about you know having two GANs. You know, they call it stack GAN one, you know, stack you know, stage two and stage one and stage two. When stage one, right, you get a rough idea about what is being asked. And then in stage two, right, you use again to go back to your text and then go back to this visual picture that your stage one has been able to able to able to reconstruct, and then use that to actually refine your output. Um, then uh, you could also you could also do a visual dialogue, right? And uh, you should you could also do a grounding, right? I mean a visual grounding. So I'm going to play this video, right, where you see that you and know for for a navigation task. Language navigation instructions, as shown on the top. A key to solving this task is grounding visual concepts mentioned in the instructions, such as banister rail and the round mirror and butterfly sculpture. Prior work. So you saw that. So, so you saw that right as 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 the right, as it kind of goes through the text, right? It realizes that uh, not that there is a banister, which means that it has to visually ground the text. Right, so so this is something like an embodied agent, right, which wants to navigate from let's say point A to point B. And then along the way, instead of just seeing what is around, and right, if you could also kind of guide it through a textual sort of information, where in this case it is able to ground what you're telling. There's a banister, and then right, and then along the way it also said that there was a round mirror, right, and then uh, right, I think it also said about it talked about a ground mirror, uh, a round mirror, and then there was a butterfly structure and so on. So if it is able to ground all of that, then you know it helps it. Else, it navigate from let's say a point A to point B. Okay, moving on, uh, you can also combine, of course, you know, audio, right? I mean, when you have uh, when you have images, you can also combine them with audio, right, in order to solve some very novel tasks. 
one of the first ones right now which i intend to talk about is really you know creating creating a stereo or kind of what is called a binaural audio from a from a single channel audio which is a monaural you know uh, there is a monaural audio a monaural is like a mixture of left and right channels and uh, you know it's an important problem you know it's because it's very hard to create a stereo setup that would actually emulate your head uh, sort of a transfer function right because our head is you know head has a certain sort of a construct and it's not often that right that, that these people keep speakers that way or keep these mics that way right and therefore one of the one of the nice things is is being able to convert a monaural audio into a binaural or a stereo output because with a stereo output right you get a sense for where the objects are right i mean even if you don't see the image you get a get a sense for something being on the left and something being on the right and so on that gives you a spatial cue and then images are fantastic in that sense right images carry a very strong spatial cue and uh, and uh, right which is what which is what something like this would actually exploit so uh, right i'm going to just play this play this video for you and if you've got a, okay right, right let me just pause for a moment I'll tell you that if you have a headphone on and you you will be able to see that when the car is on the left right you will be able to hear hear and you know, all sort of you know a sort of a dominant sound in your left uh, i love this one headphone and then as the car veers and then you know takes a u turn and goes the other way you should be able to see a shift right in terms of what you get here okay now i'm going to just play this This is monaural audio. Okay, this is a monaural audio. There's no stereo. No. So the binaural, right? If you had your headphones on, you will be able to. You're right. You would have been able to see that. Now here is another. Here is some instrument, right? So these people. I mean, Okay, so in this case, if you're wondering what, why would they want to do it if there is just you know one instrument? You can also do it if they have your multiple instruments. But then even if one instrument, you want to get a sense for from where it is being played, right? And therefore, you know, it's important even for such, uh, right, for you know, such a problem. You can actually go one step further, and then you can talk about you know talk about uh, locating or you know do a doing a sound source kind of a separation. right and for that right i'm going to play this video and the nice thing about the second one is that you know there are no i mean you don't have really a kind of a ground truth right because in most of these right you don't have you don't have ground truth labels and yet you have some kind of a weak supervision going on which helps you which helps you to helps you to kind of see do this now now i'm going to play this video first so that you get a sense of what is what is happening and then i'll kind of see come back and come back and right talk about talk about right what it is sorry let me go back one minute uh oh let me go to the previous slide yeah here okay now okay now if you if you actually hear right there are these two people yeah so so you could see that you know there was there was a sound source separation right that was clearly happening right so so on the one hand you could you could just hear to violin or I or I mean if you chose to just you know hear to the flute right you could do that and on all of this with some with some very very weak supervision right in the sense that here here uh, no the kind of visual cue is simply the fact that right, you have seen certain objects right so in the sense that you know you've seen a flute i mean which which you uh, know which of course you can have deep networks they can tell you that you have a flute in the scene you can have uh, right i mean you can you can even know that uh, there is a violin in the scene and so on and this uh, this works on the fact that there is a kind of a coarse separation and right? which happens coarse separation is very similar to this kind of a coarse segmentation right which we are which we are all familiar with but here the coarse separation is something like you kind of mix two right mix a video one and video two and then at the output you expect right each of those each of those audios to emerge but at the same time right the image you comes in the form that you expect that you know if let's say you know if in two videos you saw you saw you saw the same instrument right and they said that you know both are let's say flute or something that they you know, expect the sounds to also be close right that is the only supervision that it really uses so i you know there is no there is no there is no very hard supervision right which is actually going on and with just that right i mean uh, okay you are able to achieve something like that uh, then raju you have 5 minutes yeah and then and then of course right i mean you can also do some kind of a grounding right you know which means that you know, you can have the speech out here 
right? I mean, and then while while somebody is speaking, you might want to relate as to what in the image, right? Does this kind of thing correspond to? So, for example, right, the red one, the red one is about you know snow on the top, right? Which is what is being is being shown here, and then this blue thing is about flowers with the red, uh, no, the red flowers, right? And so on inside a garden, and then this visual grounding, right, is also a very nice problem. Can be used for video parsing. And so on, but then, uh, but then it's not true that all is hunky dory, right? Because what can happen is, you know, many of these labels are very weak, or many of these labels are noisy. For example, right? I mean, you know, here is a situation where, let's say, somebody, somebody, you know, says that here's the right label for weightlifting, and here it's background music, which is actually a positive, which is a faulty positive. Okay, so therefore, what can happen is a similar weightlifting. Otherwise, what will be a true positive is silence. Now, what happens is when you actually mix up labels like that, which is not in your hand, right? really you don't know which one is correct. And therefore, in such a case, what can happen is this can become a faulty, uh, you know, so when you do kind of a contrastive learning, right? this could become a faulty negative for this guy and this background music could be a faulty, a faulty kind of a negative you know, for, the, for, the, for, the, for, the, right? uh, for the other one. Okay, so, so in that sense, you know, all is not hunky-dory, so we have a long way to go, right? And, uh, and then right, going forward, so the vision challenges are many. Right? I mean, as I said, you have to harvest large-scale annotated data, you have to deal with noisy labels, unsupervised and weakly supervised learning, design runtime efficient, multimodal, multi, right, multi, multimodal models, and then interpretable and explainable models, right, is what you're looking for, and so on. And, and even the metrics are not really very clear. They don't seem to align very well with our human sort of a judgment. Then moving on, we also want, I also wanted to talk about this other area, which is about uh, computer vision for AR and VR, maybe from a smartphone kind of a point of view. So for example, right, I mean, you could have something like this where, where as you drive through a road, right, you want to, you want to, you want to sort of right, you know, bring in something into the seat, something like this, right? So here is the natural scene, and you sort of insert an object right into the scene in order to just simply enhance a viewer's experience. It could be that. Or, or, for example, it could also be super resolution where it is gaze driven. For example, if you're interested in this area, that is what you know, brings up, that is what gets super resolved. Or you keep moving your gaze and then, and then you want to be able to super resolve things of interest. Right? These are, again, things you know, which you can do on a smartphone. Uh, but uh, then as far as, the, as far as our own research uh, you know, sort of you know, path ahead is concerned, and we, are, we are more interested in doing this for, uh, this, 